different cultures, say that it's an incredible privilege to be born in a precious human body and to live on this beautiful gem, this garden, this delight of a planet. What a gift we were all given when we were given the opportunity to incarnate here, now, on this planet, at this time. We, uh, we live at a crossroads. There's no doubt. We all feel it. We all know it. There's something coming down the track. And uh, we have to figure out how we're going to respond to that. How we're going to turn it into an opportunity for growth rather than an opportunity for destruction. I don't think it's the first time that mankind has stood at such a crossroads. But here we are now facing it and hopefully dealing with it. A precious opportunity which should not be wasted. Um, today I'm going, to, I'm going to talk about some traces of uh, perhaps uh, a lost civilization and uh, these will look primarily at scientific traces and also at spiritual traces of that civilization uh, all around the world. Um, I believe we are a species with amnesia. I think we have forgotten our roots and our origins. I think we are quite lost in many ways and we live in a society that uh, that uh, invests huge amounts of money and vast quantities of energy in ensuring that we all stay lost. A society that uh, invests in creating unconsciousness, uh, which invests in keeping people asleep so that we're just passive consumers or producers and not really asking uh, any of the questions. And I found for me the study of the past and the mysteries of the past has been a liberating process in terms of looking uh, at the present. This is the world, of course, uh, as, uh, as it looks today. Uh, we're very concerned about such issues as global warming, climate change, and coming earth changes, uh, which, which many have, in, have intuited. But if you go back uh, 21,000 years, you will find that the world looked very different. There were gigantic ice caps covering the major land masses. The ice uh, over North America, this huge ice cap, was actually two miles deep. Can you imagine that? Two miles of ice sitting on top of New York City? Well, I don't know, but <laughs> that's, that's, that's how it was. Same in, come closer, I mean, just an, an extraordinary thing. Nobody could, could live there. Any, any traces of whatever was underneath it were ground to dust by the weight of that ice. Europe, the same story, a gigantic ice cap bigger than Antarctica covering the whole of northern Europe. Just a, an extraordinarily different world. This is our world today with its familiar contours and outlines and uh, this is the world at the end of the last, at, at, at not the end, but at the last glacial maximum, 21,300 years ago. Uh, there was no Red Sea. There was no Arabian Gulf. The Indian coastline was greatly extended. Sri Lanka joined onto the tip. Southeast Asia was a whole continent that is now underwater, just reduced to the Malaysian Peninsula and the Indonesian islands. Altogether, 10 million square miles of land were above water then that are underwater now. And 10 million square miles of land, that's the whole of Europe and China added together in terms, terms of area. So this was a very serious change that took place 
in the earth when we went from that to this. And it was a change which uh, unfolded over a period of about 10,000 years, but uh, sometimes it was extremely cataclysmic. It wasn't just a slow drip, drip, drip of the ice sheets. What would happen on top of those two mile high ice caps is that you would get a gradual accumulation of meltwater in glacial lakes on top of the ice caps. And this would perhaps accumulate for four or 5,000 years before the boundaries surrounding it broke. And the huge explosion of water poured down off the ice caps, reaching speeds of 1,000 kilometers an hour, coming down, tearing over the land, destroying the landscape, rushing into the sea, and raising uh, sea level. 30-foot, 40-foot rise in sea level overnight happened twice during the last ice age. We can imagine what a 30 or 40 foot rise in sea level would do to our civilization today if it were to happen overnight. I believe it would bring it instantly uh, to an end. Now we have traditions, uh, myths, stories from all around the world of, of an all-destroying global flood. And uh, the tendency of academics is to say that these stories are just what happened was there was some little local flood and the people in that area imaginatively elaborated it into a global flood. I don't think I need such an explanation when I know that there were global floods at the end of the last ice age, when the whole world was flooded again and again and again. Uh, and I do believe that the flood myths uh, from all around the world, amongst which, of course, I include the story of Atlantis, uh, are a memory of real events uh, recorded in myth and tradition. It's rather interesting that Plato, who is the earliest surviving source for the story of Atlantis, uh, tells us that he got it from his uh, relative Solon, who in turn got it from the ancient Egyptians, uh, and that they spoke of a time 9,000 years before the time of Solon. That's 9,600 BC, or 11,600 years before the present, when the wonderful civilization of Atlantis was destroyed in a single terrible day and a night by flooding and earthquakes. Academics think that Plato made it all up, but if Plato made it all up, it's extraordinary that he chose that date and that time, around 12,000 years ago because that was absolutely at the peak of the meltdown of the last ice age, when there was indeed global flooding. The story is all over the world. In India, it's the story of Manu, the Indian uh, Noah, uh, rescued from the, from the flood by Vishnu. In Greece, it's the story of uh, Deucalion and Pyrrha. The same thing, a, a, a couple who regenerate mankind, surviving the flood, riding it out in a box that, that rides along the waves. The Maya, too, had this story of the end of the last world age and the whole Mayan concept of cyclical time and what goes around, comes around, fits in with this very, very strongly. Here's the story of Noah from the Bible. And if you want to find the origins of the story of Noah, you need to go to Sumer, the land that is now Iraq, where the epic of Gilgamesh, almost 5,000 years old, tells essentially the same story that is told in the Bible, um, of a warning one man warned the gods are angry with mankind. They're going to send a flood. You must save what you can. It's the story of Gilgamesh, the story, the, the story of the Gilgamesh epic. Interestingly enough, if you go to the Arabian Gulf, where the Gilgamesh epic comes from, and you look at the situation at the end of the, at the, uh, the last ice age, this was the Arabian Gulf at the last glacial maximum. This is not sea. This is a river. This is the combined streams of the Tigris and the Euphrates uh, running through the otherwise completely dry uh, Arabian Gulf, uh, which formed a, a kind of Garden of Eden. It was a, one of the most wonderful places to live on Earth at that time. 
um, when most of the rest of the world was extremely arid and very inhospitable. And then, around 12,000 years ago, very, very quickly, the whole Arabian Gulf uh, became flooded. Uh, so I think that if we see a flood story from that region, talking of a global flood, uh, it's pretty easy to understand where it came from. It came from what happened. It's a memory. It's not a myth. Australia, that's how it was at the last glacial maximum 21,000 years ago with that gigantic tip of Southeast Asia nearby. That's how it is today. And again, the Aborigines of Australia who've been in Australia for 50 thousand years um, have myths and traditions of global floods. Uh, a great flood serpent which ate up the land. It's put into symbolic language, but again, it's a memory of what happened at the end of the Ice Age. Now, one of the things, when I first began to explore these mysteries 20, 20 plus years ago now, one of the first things that struck me was the the, what I call the mystery of the maps, uh, that there are certain maps that have come down to us from antiquity which show the world not as it looks today, but as it looked during the last ice age. And whenever you look into the story of these maps, you find that they were copied from older source maps, typically between the 13th and 17th centuries. So the maps that we look at are relatively recent. They date from the 13th to the 17th centuries. But when you find their origins, you find that the map makers drew on many source maps which are no longer available to us. Um, and and uh, these ancient maps seem to record the world as it looked 20, 15,000 years ago. This was the level of map making technology um, in uh, the seventh century in Spain and indeed in the 13th century. These are called TO maps because of the shape. They're quite pretty, but you definitely would not want to navigate by them. <laughs> They're really bad for navigation. Um, actually, east is up on these maps. This would be Jerusalem, the center of the world. Uh, this is the Mediterranean. Here's Spain, here's North Africa. Um, and, uh, as I say, pretty but, but useless. However, that map's from 1283, and round about that time, end of the 13th century, flooded into Europe a whole new set of maps, and nobody really knows where they came from. Ptolemy's maps, we know of Ptolemy, of course, but he himself 2,000 years ago, was drawing on earlier source maps when he created his maps. And those maps disappeared during the Dark Ages. They were preserved in monasteries, and they came to the attention of mariners at the end of the 13th century. They're not as good as modern maps, but they're very good, and you can navigate by them. Um, another mysterious group of maps appeared at that time, and these are the so-called... Uh, Portolans, the Portolan cartographic tradition. This is the uh, Pisan chart from 1280. It's the earliest surviving example. Uh, that's Italy there. You're coming into Spain and North Africa here and the Holy Land there. Um, what's remarkable about these maps uh, is that they incorporate incredibly precise latitudes and longitudes. Now, latitude is a relatively easy thing to do simply by measuring the height of the sun or stars above the horizon, but the pole star above the horizon specifically. But longitude requires technology. It requires a chronometer that can maintain accurate time as the Earth spins. And uh, our civilization was not able to do longitude until the late 18th century. Uh, and that's why many mariners before the, the longitude problem was cracked would end up bumping into coastlines that they didn't expect to be there because they'd done their calculations wrong. But weirdly, in these older maps, highly accurate longitudes. How do we explain that other than as a heritage from an earlier map-making tradition? Charles Hapgood, his work on the maps of the ancient sea kings uh, is... Uh, 
uh, really the best source on this, on this material. And he's suggesting that the Portaland tradition came through a predecessor of Ptolemy, Marinus of Tyre, perhaps through Ptolemy, stored in the library of Alexandria. When the library of Alexandria was burned down, some of those maps went to Constantinople. Crusaders went into Constantinople and took away some of those maps and reintroduced them to the world. That's roughly the, the suggestion here. I think everybody's heard of the Piri Reis map, which is a Portaland map. And uh, here we see South America's east coast to be compared there, the west coast of Africa. And down here at the very southern tip of South America, a continuous land mass uh, that appears to be Antarctica uh, on a map dating from 1513. And it's really a puzzle if you find Antarctica on maps from the 16th century uh, because our civilization didn't discover Antarctica until the early 19th century. Here's uh, Antarctica as it looks today. And uh, here's Antarctica as it looked uh, around the year 1800 in this map from Russia, which shows no Antarctica at all. And it's not there because we haven't discovered it in 1800. We didn't discover it until 1818. Yet if you go back to the 1600s and the 1500s, Antarctica is all over ancient maps. There it is in uh, this beautiful work of Orontius Phineas, a rather accurate depiction of the continent of Antarctica. And uh, here again, um, a map by Mercator, the, the, the famous, everybody's heard of the Mercator projection, a great map maker. Here again, Antarctica, present in that map. Both of those maps, the Orontius Phineas map and the Mercator map, drew on earlier source maps, now lost to us. Is it possible that those earlier source maps may go back to an earlier civilization? One that had the technology to explore the entire globe to map it mathematically in a way that, that we can recognize today as highly sophisticated, because that's what these maps seem to show. Here's one of those Ptolemaic maps, not quite so good as the, as the Portalands, but still pretty good. And interesting, really, to, to look at Southeast Asia and how Southeast Asia is represented in this huge land mass here, and to compare that with, um, well, there's Southeast Asia today, there it is on that map, and here's how it looked 21,300 years ago. And I find a really remarkable similarity between what the geologists now tell us Southeast Asia looked like 21,000 years ago and what it looks like uh, on this map, even with the tip of the Australian landmass coming into the image right there. Another Ptolemaic map from 1513. Off the British Isles, and off the island of Ireland is a little island here. Can you see it? This little island is called High Brazil. Lots of people believed in the existence of High Brazil. I know personally of two expeditions that were sent out from Bristol, which is a town very near where I live, to look for High Brazil. But they couldn't find it because they didn't need a ship to find it. They needed a time machine. You have to go back 13,000 years to find High Brazil. And that's where it was. The geology shows us quite clearly with lower sea levels at that time, this landmass was exposed around 13,000 years ago, the, the landmass that is shown on that map. And let's go back to the Piri Reis map again. On it, right up here, there's an island which doesn't exist. Not today, anyway. And on that island, there's these curious stones side by side. Do you see them there? That island is in exactly the place where Bimini is today. And underwater off Bimini is the famous Bimini Road. I think that that's what's shown on this image here, how it looked before it was flooded at the end of the Ice Age. Now, if we are looking at the faint 
fingerprints and traces of a lost civilization that explored and mapped the world more than 13,000 years ago. What other traces are there? Well, I wrote a whole book about this called Fingerprints of the Gods, so you'll find it all in there. But <laughs> I, want to, I want to concentrate on, on the spiritual side of things because there is, a, there is an astonishing spiritual continuity all around the world. And I'm going to speak of it today with specific focus to ancient Egypt, uh, but also with, uh, with a secondary focus on Cambodia. Um, again, the Piri Reis map. It actually turns out to be drawn on a very modern projection, which is an azimuthal equidistant projection, and it's based on Cairo, where Giza is, where the pyramids of Giza are. So this seems a good opportunity to go to Giza. And here we find the majestic, the incredible, the mysterious Great Sphinx speaking to us in riddles down the ages, this beautiful and majestic monument, and the pyramids themselves. My wife, Santa, took uh, all of these photographs. She and I have been privileged to visit, visit Egypt times beyond counting. Uh, there is something truly magical and mysterious about that site. It is, it is a very special place on the world. It isn't the only special place, but it is extraordinarily special, and it touches, it touches the soul, and it touches something deep in us, and I believe that that's because it was designed to do that. The three great pyramids of Giza standing there in the desert like three stars brought down to earth. Now, one thing about the Great Pyramid you can tell immediately, even though you might not know anything else, is that astronomy was involved in creating it. The Great Pyramid is stunningly accurately aligned to true north, south, east, and west. It's actually within 3 60ths of a single degree uh, of true north. And that is, uh, that is an incredible accurate alignment, um, especially when you're dealing with a monument with a footprint of 13 acres. Um, it would be very hard to do it today. We probably could do it, but it would be difficult. And the architect would want to know why. <laughs> I mean, why do you want to do that? You, we can build you this amazing, huge monument, but must it really be within 3 60ths of a single degree of true north? That's making the problem really, really huge. So it tells us not only were astronomers involved to get that level of accuracy, but also that it was important to them. It really mattered to them to be precise, to be on the, on the button uh, in that way. And uh, a second thing which just will not go away at Giza, no matter how angry the archaeologists become, no matter how they swarm out of their nest and leap all over anybody who dares to criticize the existing paradigm, what will not go away uh, is the hint of much greater antiquity surrounding the entire Giza complex. That's what won't go away. And uh, that's what I want to look into a little bit uh, just now. This is from the Temple of Seti I in Abydos. And we see the pharaoh Seti showing his young son, Ramesses II, a list of all the kings of Egypt who'd ruled before them. And that list goes back through the historical pharaohs who we know about back to around about the date that we would call 3000 BC, when Egyptian civilization is supposed to have begun. But it doesn't stop there. It keeps on going back. It goes back thousands and thousands and thousands of years before that, until the time of the gods, the time that the ancient Egyptians called Zeptepi, the first time, when the gods brought civilization to Egypt. That's what the pharaoh is showing his son, a connection to the gods going back thousands of years into the past. And from the tomb of Seti I, again, we see this idea. It goes right the way back to the god Osiris. 
He is showing the way to the future Horus kings of Egypt, how they should live, how they should create a kingdom, how it should be in harmony between earth and heaven. Everything goes back to the first time, to the time of the gods, to the time of Osiris. Sorry. Temple of Horus at Edfu. Horus is the son of Osiris in the uh, traditions of the ancient Egyptians. At this temple of Horus, there are whole walls covered with texts. And those texts are known as the Edfu building texts. And this is what they look like. And they're very mysterious. Many people, many archaeologists will tell you that there is no flood tradition in Egypt. This is absolute nonsense. They clearly have not read the Edfu building texts. Because the Edfu building texts speak of a homeland of the primeval ones. They say it was an island. They say it's where the gods lived. They say there was a great flood there, which utterly destroyed it. And that those gods who survived came to Egypt, settled in Egypt, and started to reestablish what they had had before. They built what were called primeval mounds all over Egypt, which were to be the sites of all future temples and religious structures uh, in Egypt. Is it possible that some of the monuments of ancient Egypt are actually much older than the Egyptologists tell us? Here's the Osarion in Abydos, named after the god uh, Osiris. And uh, it's a very curious structure, uh, gigantic blocks of stone, 100 ton weights are very common in the Osarion. Um, and weirdly, it's close to 100 feet lower than the nearby temple of Seti I. Now, Egyptolo Egyptologists attribute this monument to Seti I. Um, but it, was, it, it actually appears to have been built at a much earlier phase. Um, it's, just so much, it's just so much lower down. It's like there's been an accumulation of silt on top of it, and then thousands of years later, Seti I came along and built his temple. And then when the archaeologists excavated it, they said, well, that's by Seti I. This is nearby. Ah, it must be by Seti I. There's no good evidence connecting it to Seti I at all. The great sphinx of Giza. I'm not going to go into detail into Robert Schock's and John Anthony West's extraordinary work on the uh, rainfall erosion of the Sphinx, but it has thrown a real spanner in the works of Egyptology, and the Egyptologists are still very upset about it. You know, how dare a geologist suggest that the Sphinx actually might be thousands of years older than it's supposed to be, because that is what Schock and West are suggesting, that these erosion patterns in the trench surrounding the Sphinx, which we would have seen on the body of the Sphinx too if it had not been restored again and again down the ages, that this erosion pattern can only be caused by exposure to thousands of years of heavy, heavy rainfall. And no such rainfall fell in Egypt uh, in 2500 BC when the Sphinx is supposed to have been built. You have to go back to the end of the last ice age to find that massive precipitation that could have caused this level uh, of weathering uh, in Egypt. And these extraordinary temples that stand in front of the Sphinx were created from the limestone that was quarried out around the body of the Sphinx to create the body. Therefore, they are as old as the Sphinx. If the Sphinx is 12,000 years old, then so are these temples. And these temples, um, like a mighty memorials of a, of a forgotten uh, past um, are really hard to explain. <laughs> there are blocks of stone, again, in the range of 100 tons uh, in these temples, and they just have been built up as though it's an easy thing to do, as though it's easy to manipulate 100-ton blocks of stone. Now, the three great pyramids standing above the modern city of Cairo. Um, that atmosphere of strangeness and, and mystery uh, cannot be escaped. Let's take a, a quick flight around the Great Pyramids uh, of Giza. We're looking from the east side here uh, over the village of Nazlet al-Saman, the Great Pyramid, Pyramid of Kefrin, supposedly the Pyramid of Menkara. 
Um, we'll come around again. We're swinging around to the west side now. This is the north face of the Great Pyramid. The second pyramid, the third pyramid. Can you see the Sphinx, by the way? This is the Sphinx down here. The Sphinx is 270 feet long and 80 feet high. But it's dwarfed by the pyramids. It almost uh, disappears from view. And here's the valley of the Nile off to the east. So let's just come in closer and closer to these amazing monuments. The top of the Great Pyramid, 480 feet above the ground, a flattened area on top of the Great Pyramid there. And there I am on top of the Great Pyramid. <laughs> now, I'm not showing this picture for, uh, well, that's how, I, that's how I used to look in those days. <laughs> <laughs> ah, sweet bird of youth. <laughs> how quickly does she fly? Um, we climbed up the, um, the southwest uh, face there, uh, the, the, the southwest corner. And uh, actually, I've, I've climbed the Great Pyramid five times. Uh, three of the climbs were uh, legal, and two were illegal. Now, this was one of the illegal climbs. Um, and on one of the climbs when I had more time, because I was up there legally and the police weren't going to arrest me, Santa and I, we spent some time looking around at the graffiti on top of the Great Pyramid. It's astonishing. There's graffiti going back hundreds of years up there. Even Mercator, that map maker, he left his graffiti up there. Loads of people have been climbing the Great Pyramid and leaving their graffiti. Including, I found, and this was an astonishing moment for me, uh, one step down, just behind me there, is a piece of graffiti that says, P. Hancock, April 5th, 1916. Hmm. My grandfather was called Philip Hancock. <laughs> ha! He was in Egypt in 1916. After we got down off the pyramid, I called my dad. He was still alive then and asked him to look at my grandfather's diary. What did he say for the date of April 5th, 1916? One single line. Climbed the Great Pyramid today. <laughs> <laughs> it was an extraordinary moment for me. And... Uh, there's something about this place. It's like flying on a magic carpet above the city of Cairo. It's just, it's such a privilege, such a gift to be able to, to, to go there. I don't want to bore you with statistics. It's just 13.1 acres. It weighs 6 million tons. It's got 2.3 million blocks of stone. It's 481 feet high. It just is the most amazing thing. You know, it's just, you, you, you can look at it and just kind of miss it, and then you look at it closely and you begin to realize you're looking at something that's utterly Impossible. I just want to take you on a quick journey around some of the interior of the Great Pyramid. Um, and uh, I think we'll start, we'll start down here in the so-called subterranean chamber, which is 600 feet vertically beneath the apex of the pyramid and about 100 feet uh, beneath the base. Um, and uh, it's carved out of solid rock. They went 300 feet, a sloped corridor, sloping at an angle of 26 degrees. Uh, you have to go 300 feet down it, and then you reach this chamber at the bottom. So they had to make that chamber. They had to cut down through the rock 300 feet. It's about 3 feet 6 inches high and the same wide. So you have got to go down like this all the way down. And you get to the bottom, and here's this rock-hewn chamber deep, uh, deep underground. And here's a couple of likely lads in the rock-hewn chamber. That's me and my friend Robert Boval, the author of the Orion Mystery, just to give you a sense of the size of the room. Now, coming out of the subterranean chamber, let's go back up this passageway which leads to it. There it is, cut from solid rock, as, uh, as I described. And then you come to this junction here, and you go up the so-called ascending corridor, and along a horizontal passage that leads you to the so-called Queen's Chamber. We don't know what the builders of these pyramids called these chambers. All these names are modern attributions. Um, let's just take a quick look inside the Queen's Chamber. The statistics are there. There's these curious little shafts in the walls of the Queen's Chamber. Up until the 1870s, uh, this shaft was not visible. It was covered by a block of stone. When they completed the chamber, they closed it. 
Um, but a, a British Freemason called Wayman Dixon, who'd noticed that there were shafts in the chamber above, the king's chamber, wondered if there might be shafts in the queen's chamber, and he went around tapping the walls. And he found these hollow points, cut out the stone, and sure enough, there's these shafts. And my friend Robert Boval has established the astronomical connections of these shafts. Um, that the Queen's Chamber shafts uh, point, the southern shaft, this one, points to Sirius, and the northern shaft points to Beta Ursa Minor. Very curious thing, especially since these shafts actually do not exit on the outside of the pyramid. The ones from the King's Chamber do, but these ones don't. And uh, back in 1993, a German robotics engineer, Rudolf Gantenbrink, sent a little robot up that shaft, and 165 feet up the shaft, the robot came to this door with two metal handles. Rudolf Gantenbrink was immediately banned from doing any further work in Egypt and was sent away. Uh, the project was taken over by the Egyptian government. Uh, some years later, uh, Zahi, Zahi Hawass um, sent another robot up the shaft with a mission to drill through that door and find out what was on the other side. And uh, there we go, there's the drill, there's the door, there's the hole that they made. You know what they found on the other side? A space and another door. <laughs> it's like an invitation. Search me. The pyramid is saying, search me, but I'm not going to make it easy for you. You're really going to have to figure this thing out. We still don't know what's at the end of that shaft. Okay, so we're going to come out of the Queen's Chamber, back along the horizontal corridor. Now we're looking up the Grand Gallery, 153 feet long, 28 feet high. This is called a Corbell vault. Each level protrudes slightly over the level below it and narrows up uh, towards the ceiling. Well, these blocks weigh about 70 tons each. They're laid at an angle of 26 degrees. You can't get a sheet of paper between the joints. They're unbelievably pre precise. It's like uh, being compared to opticians' work on a scale of acres. Uh, an astonishing feat of construction. The work of giants, really. At the top of the Grand Gallery, you have an entrance to the King's Chamber. This is the King's Chamber here. And above the king's chamber, not known until the early 19th century, are one, two, three, four, five more chambers. And getting into those chambers is really fun. <laughs> I'll come to that in a moment. But let's, uh, let's first of all go uh, into the king's chamber. Uh, and this is, this is what the king's chamber looks like. There, those are those shafts again. Uh, this is the northern shaft, the southern shafts on this side. Uh, one pointing to Orion's belt, and the other again pointing to one of the circumpolar stars. It's a beautiful geometric room. It's made of granite blocks. The Great Pyramid is a limestone monument. These granite blocks were brought about 500 miles from Aswan. They were lifted to a height of hundreds of feet above the ground and put in, into position in this extraordinary chamber uh, in the heart of the pyramid. There is a sarcophagus in it. I and my colleagues believe that this is... Uh, not a sarcophagus that ever contained the body of the pharaoh Khufu, or of any pharaoh. Uh, we think that it was involved in, in some kind of process, some kind of initiation. I'm going to talk about that uh, a, a little bit. But because there is a sarcophagus in it, immediately the assumption has been made that this must have been the burial chamber of uh, Khufu. Um, let's look at this setup again here. The king's chamber, and the so-called relieving chambers uh, up above it, rather similar to the Jed Pillar, the symbolic backbone of Osiris, which is a symbol of resurrection and rebirth in the ancient Egyptian uh, religion. It seems that they were creating a, a symbol of resurrection, uh, of rebirth, within the, within the Great Pyramid. To get into those rooms, here's what you do. You put a ladder 30 feet high up against this wall, and you lean it up against that side there, and there's a little hole just a bit wider than me, which fortunately a rope now hangs out of, and you grab hold of that rope, haul your body into it, pull yourself through, and then you get into a narrow tunnel, and that leads you into the first, and um, eventually into the, all five uh, of these chambers. And I'll just take you to the top chamber. Uh, that's that one up there. And um, again, these extraordinary 
huge blocks of stone. These are in the range of 100 tons each, which form the floor uh, of, uh, of this chamber. And indeed, all the other chambers, again, have these gigantic blocks of stone, which, which, uh, which are almost impossible uh, to move, really. But there they are. More graffiti inside. Sister M.T. Martin, 6th of February, 1915. Uh, oh, there's me, <laughs> me with one of my kids, Layla. Um, uh, again, just to show you the, the size and the, and the scale of the thing. Um, we'll go back to the pyramids. Here is the only evidence that Egyptologists are able to cite which connects the Great Pyramid to the Pharaoh Khufu. Uh, and that is a cartouche which appears to say the name Khufu that is found in that very topmost relieving chamber that I, that I showed you. Uh, it's round about over here somewhere. And um, there are no other inscriptions whatsoever inside the Great Pyramid, not one. Uh, but this, uh, this graffiti, as it's referred to, um, is supposed to be what's called a quarry mark that was put on the blocks by the gangs of construction workers who were quarrying out the blocks that would be built into the Great Pyramid. And they said, this is Khufu's block, or something, something like that. It's not very convincing evidence that the pyramid was built by Khufu or for Khufu. There is, a, there is a hint of doubt over the authenticity of the cartouche itself. Could it have been forged by Howard Weiss, who found it in the early 19th century? Um, but one thing's for sure, if Khufu was the builder of the pyramid, he had a pretty small ego for such a big monument. <laughs> this is the only statue of Khufu that's ever survived. It's about two inches high. And, uh, you know, you would have thought he'd have put his name all over this thing instead of just on some bit of graffiti up in a block in a chamber that nobody's ever going to see. But he didn't. It's absolutely bare. There are no texts, nothing in there that tells you what's going on. However, if you go down to Saqqara, about 15 miles south of Giza, you will come to a group of pyramids dating from the 5th and 6th dynasties, not the 4th dynasty, which this one supposedly dates to. And those pyramids are filled with text. Now, I'm just showing this overlay. Actually, I'm going I'm to give away Santa's secret. She did this by accident. <laughs> Because Santa t we were at Giza, Santa took a shot of the pyramids of Giza. Then we went down to Saqqara, and we went into the pyramid of Unas. And Santa took a photograph of the pyramid of Unas, and we got this double exposure, where the, the pyramid of Unas is overlaid on the, on the Giza pyramids. And here are the so-called pyramid texts, the star-covered ceiling of the pyramid of Unas, and the pyramid texts on the walls. And uh, these uh, pyramid texts are the earliest surviving recensions of what we now know as the books of the dead, the ancient Egyptian books of the dead. And they concern the mystery of life and death and what it is we're doing on this planet. They're very deep. They're very profound. Um, and they are, it, it, it seems to me that they were putting in writing there what the Great Pyramid does in architecture alone. The, the Great Pyramid does it entirely symbolically in architecture. In the later pyramids, they expressed it in texts. And all of these texts, whether it's the, the pyramid texts, which are the oldest surviving, the coffin texts, because they're written inside the lids of coffins, the book of what is in the Duat, which you'll find painted on the walls of many of the tombs in the Valley of the Kings, um, and, and the books of the dead, which were papyrus scrolls that were placed with the deceased inside the, uh, the coffin. Uh, all of these seek to prepare us for the journey that the ancient Egyptians believed that we will face, that we will confront on our own deaths. And the ancient Egyptians regarded the issue of life and death uh, as extremely important. Our civilization kind of avoids the subject of death, really. Um, we, 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 we're not, we, we don't want to know about death. Um, and uh, we, we try to shove it away to the margins and not think about it. And least of all, to prepare ourselves psychologically and spiritually for that moment that will come to us all. The ancient Egyptians put their best minds to work for 3,000 years on considering the mystery of death and what we may or may not confront uh, when we die. 
And when it comes to these matters, I would rather listen to the ancient Egyptians than any bloody modern scientist. Because the modern scientists are just pygmies, you know. They're infants, they're children. They may be able to weigh, measure, and count brilliantly, but they know nothing of matters of the spirit. We need to turn to civilizations like ancient Egypt, the ancient Maya, and to surviving shamanistic cultures around the world to understand, really, the mysteries of life and death. So let's have a little bit of a, a look at the Egyptian story. These are the souls of Pe and Neken. They're a mysterious brotherhood that was entrusted with transmitting the religion of Osiris to the future. So important was it that it had to be preserved and, and passed down from generation to generation. Um, Osiris was the first king. He lived in the legendary first time. He was the civilizer. He brought civilization to Egypt. And he was murdered by his antagonist, Set, and 72 conspirators. And his body was hacked to pieces and, and reassembled and, and, and revivified through the magic of Isis, the goddess Isis. And uh, here we see that, that what, what, what happens next is Osiris is brought back to life uh, so that he can inseminate uh, Isis. She hovers over him in the form of a, of a bird, of a, of, a, of a kite, and receives his seed and produces their son, Horus, who continues the divine, the divine line. And uh, here we see Horus performing the rituals that bring about the resurrection of his father in the, in the heavens. Horus comes to you, O king, that he may do for you what he did for his father Osiris, so that you may live as those in the sky live, that you may be more extant than those who exist on earth. Raise yourself because of your strength. May you ascend to the sky. May the sky give birth to you like Orion. May you have power in your body and may you protect yourself from your foe. That's from the pyramid texts. Um, and again, this image from the tomb of Seti I, Osiris riding on his boat of stars, showing the way to the future pharaohs of Egypt. Nobody disputes that uh, when the ancient Egyptians looked at the constellation of Orion, they saw it as the figure of Osiris in the sky. This is not a controversial statement. Uh, Orion ruled over the celestial afterlife kingdom of the Duat, and the Duat had very specific astronomical coordinates roughly between the constellation of Orion and Leo and divided by the great river, the Milky Way, which the ancient Egyptians called the Winding Waterway. And again, all of this is laid out in the books. A lot of this is the work of Robert Baval. He and I worked together on the message of the Sphinx. When you look at the layout of the pyramids on the ground. Of course, everybody in this room is familiar with the Orion correlation theory, Robert Boval's extraordinary discovery, which has really revolutionized our understanding of Egypt. You find that the three pyramids are representing the three stars of Orion's belt. The Nile is just right for the Milky Way. I'm not suggesting that the ancient Egyptians built the Nile. I'm suggesting that Giza was put where it was because the Nile was there, and it happened to reflect a celestial item that they wanted to draw down. Uh, and then we have this lion-bodied monument and constellation of Leo, which I'm going to speak about uh, a, bit, a, bit layer, a bit later. So um, Osiris ruled in the first time, and we shouldn't be surprised that the astronomical layout contains hints of very ancient origins. And I'll come back to those uh, in a moment. I want to talk about the journey through the Duat, this strange parallel realm, which is at once a place in the heavens and also a kind of underworld with narrow corridors and passageways and strange chambers that you find yourselves in and, and, and monsters and, 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 and demons. And you have to be prepared for every challenge that you will face there. In fact, that was what your life was for. It was to prepare you for that moment when you make the journey through the afterlife realm. Sometimes the god Anubis would act as your psychopomp, as your guide, uh, leading you through the afterlife. Um, 
the texts make it clear that there was a great secret in the fifth division of the Duat, which is referred to as the land of Sokar and of Rostau. And it's not an accident that Rostau was one of the ancient names of uh, Giza. In fact, in this image from the book of what is in the Duat, we see a pyramid, we see a sphinx, and we see a hidden chamber uh, with this curious figure, three-headed serpent here, a winged serpent very familiar from this part of the world. Go back inside those chambers and corridors. There's the grand gallery of the Great Pyramid. Here's an image from the book of what is in the Duat. A boat, a huge boat, is buried on the south side of the Great Pyramid. We find boats used in the navigation of the Duat, the narrow corridors and passageways. Um, strange chambers here with star gods seated. And the king's chamber. What I'm suggesting is that the Great Pyramid was your journey through the Duat in stone. It was a place where you prepared for that journey. And uh, I think that this room probably has something to do with this scene. And this is called the judgment scene. And it takes place in the fifth division of the Duat in the Hall of Mart. Mart is the goddess of cosmic harmony, of truth, of justice. Uh, and she is symbolized by this feather. And here we see the deceased, in this case one of the Ptolemaic pharaohs, because this is from Deir al Medina on the west bank at Luxor, being ushered into the Hall of Mart, which is also called the Judgment Hall of Osiris. And here in the background we see a set of scales. And uh, there are the scales. Here is the god Thoth, writing on a tablet. This monster is called Amit, the eater of the dead. He is part crocodile, part uh, hippo, and part hyena. And here is Osiris sitting in judgment. The weighing of the heart is the central aspect of this scene. And what we see here, weighed against the feather of truth, of harmony, of justice, is this symbol representing the heart of the deceased. You would not want your heart to weigh heavy with sin. You would not want that to happen uh, because uh, then you might have to face the eater of the dead and you definitely don't want to do that. Um, it's as if your whole life is weighed up in this moment. These figures here are the, amongst the 42 assessors in the Judgment Hall of Osiris. They ask you questions. Did you kill? Did you steal? Actually, all the Ten Commandments are there, and another 30 as well. And you're supposed to be able to answer all of them, no, I didn't do that. You're supposed to be, say, you're supposed to be, to, to, to be able to answer in the, in the negative. But there's a, so this is moral behavior. But there's a sense that the, that the judgment of moral behavior in the ancient Egyptian judgment scene is only part of the story. As though it's necessary to lead a good life, but not sufficient. It's not alone enough just to lead a good life. It's as though these texts, these ideas are, are, are recognizing what I said at the beginning, that, that, that comes down to us from many ancient traditions, that it's a precious gift to be born in a human body. And the question that's being asked of you there, not only is, did you behave morally and decently towards your fellow humans, but also, did you, did you use that opportunity? You were given an opportunity. Did you use it well? Did you live? Did you really live that life that you were given? Or did you waste it away? That's the second aspect of the, of the judgment scene, and the more difficult and the more complex one. So, Thoth records the verdict. If your heart outweighed the feather, if your life was lived inflicting misery and cruelty and pain on others, if it was, uh, if your spiritual potential was utterly frittered away and wasted, this is what you would face. Annihilation, never to be born again, never to come back. Your story is over. It's rubbed out from the book of life. 
if you've lived your life right, then something wonderful is being proposed, and that's the, the life of millions of years. And I just want to read a passage from the Normandy, Normandy Ellis. Ellis translation of the ancient Egyptian Book of the Dead. I stand before the masters who witnessed the creation, who were with Ra that morning the sun rolled into being, who were with Osiris in the grave as he gathered himself together and burst from the tomb white with heat, a light and shining god. Hail Thoth, architect of truth, give me words of power that I may recall my years and weave together my history. Hail Thoth, architect of truth, Give me words of power that I may form the characters of my own evolution. I stand before the masters who witnessed the generation, who were the authors of their own forms, who rolled into being, who walked the dark, circuitous passageways of their own becoming, who saw with their own eyes their destinies and the shapes of things to come. I stand before the masters who witnessed the working of magic, who were with Isis the evening she became the swallow, and her lamentations filled the air, who were with her as she shook down her black hair and veiled the God's transformation in secret, who witnessed the conception of the divine child, though his coming was yet unrevealed. Hail Thoth, architect of truth, give me words of power that when I speak the life of a man, I may give his story meaning. I stand before the masters who know the histories of the dead, who decide what tales to hear again, who judge the books of lives as either full or empty, who are themselves authors of truth, and they are Isis and Osiris, the divine intelligences. And when the story is written, and the end is good, and the soul of a man is perfected, with a shout they lift him into heaven. Hail Thoth, architect of truth, give me words of power that I may complete my story, and begin life anew. I stand before the masters who witnessed the transformation of the body of a man into the body and spirit, who were witnesses to the resurrection when the corpse of Osiris entered the mountain and the soul of Osiris walked out shining. He gathered his heel and his leg, he gathered his arms and his backbones, he gathered the dreams crackling inside the dark cave of his skull. He knitted himself together in secret. He came forth from death, a shining thing, his, his face, face white, white with heat. Perhaps these monuments formed a, a, a sacred landscape in which the afterlife journey uh, was prepared to, the ultimate goal of joining Osiris in the sky, winning the life of millions of years. It's part of an ancient spiritual system. And what it celebrated and nurtured above all else was the gift of life. And yes, the ancient Egyptians sought immortal life, but they did not take it for granted. Here is Thoth writing the name of Ramesses II on the tree of life, the life of millions of years. If you ask the ancient Egyptians where this religion came from, they'd tell you it came from the gods in Zeptepi, the first time when the gods came to Egypt. And uh, here's the great, the, the second pyramid on the equinox, on the spring equinox. You can see the shadow, it's like a gnomon, shadow running absolutely due west. Um, Clues as to when the first time might have been are actually contained in the monuments themselves. And they require us to understand a little bit about a complicated astronomical phenomenon called the precession of the equinoxes. Um, it's accepted that the ancient Egyptians had pretty good observational astronomy. But uh, most mainstream uh, astronomers today would absolutely reject the notion that the ancient Egyptians had any knowledge at all of the precession of the equinoxes. Certainly, astronomy in ancient Egypt was um, 
a spiritual rather than a scientific pursuit. There's no doubt about that. I mean, the second shrine of Tutankhamun is particularly interesting in this respect. You can see these initiates connected through the, through the third eye uh, to a star in the sky. It's somehow as though the, the study of the heavens is, is, is part of our fulfilling ourselves as, uh, as individuals on this, uh, on this planet. But procession of the equinoxes? No, the, the, the scholars say they, they couldn't possibly have known that. It's a process that we think is caused by the pull of the sun and the moon on the earth. It causes the earth to wobble like a top, which is slowing down, and that wobble takes 26,000 years, actually 25,920 years to complete one great cycle. And it unfolds at the rate of one degree every 72 years. Um, each of the 12 constellations of the zodiac gets 30 degrees along the ecliptic, the path of the sun, and the procession runs in the opposite direction to the normal direction of the zodiac. It goes, it goes backwards, it's processing backwards. Um, and uh, you have roughly 2,160 years in each house of the zodiac, uh, and these are thought to define the age. So this is why we say we live in the dawning of the age of Aquarius, um, because in our time, the sun is moving out of Pisces on the spring equinox and moving uh, into Aquarius. It isn't quite there yet. We're not in the age of Aquarius. Uh, we're perhaps not even on the cusp. Another 100, 200 years, and we'll be much closer to the beginning of the age of Aquarius than we, than we are today. <clears throat> also from the second shrine of Tutankhamun, this rather mysterious image. Mehen, the enveloper, the serpent of cyclical time, he who hides the hours. I think this is one of many references to the secret knowledge of precession in ancient Egypt. And the Sphinx is part of the way that we can reveal this, uh, a, a marker on the clock of time. The great Sphinx, it looks perfectly due east. It's aligned absolutely perfectly to due east. And Santa took this photograph from the back of the Sphinx, uh, looking in the direction of the gaze of the Sphinx. And this photograph, at dawn, on the spring equinox, from the back of the Sphinx. And there you can see the proof. The great Sphinx gazes directly at the rising sun on the spring equinox. Summer solstice, the sun is way over here. Winter solstice, it's way over here. Spring equinox, dead in line with the gaze of the Sphinx. And I'll just take another moment to do another short reading about the ancient Egyptian concept of the sun. Men praise thee in thy name, Ra, and they swear by thee, for thou art Lord over them. Thou hearest with thine eyes, and thou seest with thine, sorry, <laughs> thou hearest with thine ears, and thou seest with thine eyes. Millions of years have gone over the world. I cannot tell the number of those through which thou hast passed. Thou dost pass over and dost travel through untold spaces, requiring millions and hundreds of thousands of years to pass over. Thou passest through them in peace, and thou steerest thy way across the watery abyss to the place which thou lovest. This thou doest in one little moment of time, and then thou dost sink down and dost make an end of ours. Astonishingly sophisticated notion of the big numbers and distances uh, involved in the, in the sun. Um, so the sun gazes, the sphinx gazes at the rising sun at dawn on the spring equinox. And it does that every year in all times. What changes is the stellar background against which that sunrise is occurring. That's what's changed by the procession of the equinoxes. Um, and uh, processional drift occurring at the rate of one degree every 72 years. 30 degrees gives you 2,160 years. The whole process, 12 houses of the zodiac, takes you 25,920 years. And using the science of procession, looking at the monuments of Giza, I can tell you that this diagram on the ground, the Sphinx and the Three Great Pyramids, maps the sky not as it looked in 2500 BC, but as it looked in 10,500 BC, 12 and a half thousand years ago, 
when the constellation of Leo housed the sun on the spring equinox and the great sphinx gazed at her celestial counterpart in the heavens, the Milky Way and the Nile, the three stars of Orion's belt and the pyramid. Um, very strange, this. Does it tell us that the ancient Egyptians knew that date and wanted to memorialize it in stone? Or does it suggest actually that some of these monuments may actually go back to that very ancient time, long, long, long before the pharaohs of, of Egypt? I'm going to move a little quickly, but I, the, the work on Procession of the Equinoxes, the fundamental work is Hamlet's Mill by Giorgio de Santillana and Hertha von Deschend. It's a tough read. They were, uh, Giorgio de Santillana was a professor of history of science at MIT. But what they document in that book is global, worldwide knowledge of precession of the equinoxes recorded in myth. A series of numbers that keep coming up again and again and again, all over the world, in every part of the world, which only can arise from precession. And uh, Santillana and von Deschend hid it in the little paragraph right in the middle of the book. They traced it back to some almost unbelievable ancestor civilization uh, of remote antiquity. 72 is the heartbeat of the cycle, lots of numbers. 72 divided by two is 36, 72 plus 36 is 108, half of 108 is 54. All these are what I call the precessional numbers, which are derived from and related to the process of precession of the equinoxes. And you find them in myths, in Viking myths, in, in Indian traditions, um, the story of Osiris and his 72 uh, assailants, the number of stanzas in the Rig Veda, it's just all over the world, in myth everywhere, the story of precession of the equinoxes in numbers. Now, the Great Pyramid, Egyptologists know this, but they say it's a coincidence, is a mathematical scale model of the northern hemisphere of the Earth. It's quite simple, if you take the base perimeter measurement of the Great Pyramid, and multiply it by a specific number, and that number is 43,200, you get the equatorial circumference of the Earth. And if you take the height of the Great Pyramid and multiply it by the same number, you get the polar radius of the Earth. As I say, Egyptologists know this, but they say it's a coincidence. Actually, if it were any other number than 43,200, I might have to accept it could be a coincidence, but 43,200 is one of those precessional numbers. It's one of those numbers that is derived from the sequence that evolves from one degree uh, every 72 years. 72 times 30 equals 2,160, that's one house of the zodiac. 2,160 by 20 gives you 43,200. Let's jump to Angkor in Cambodia. Turns out, that from Giza to Angkor is exactly 72 degrees of longitude. Weird, that. Another one of those precessional numbers. And uh, makes me think of a whole worldwide project establishing sacred sites at certain positions of longitude around the globe uh, and, and, and creating them for a very specific reason. And I think Angkor and Giza are intimately connected, although they seem to stem from very different periods of history. Angkor Wat. By the way, Ankh-hor means life to the Horus in the ancient Egyptian language. That's another one of those coincidences, according to the scholars. Here's the Angkor Wat temple. Look at this amazing axis running all the way through it. Actually, it just disappears. We're slightly off the screen here, but it disappears right over the horizon, miles and miles away. It's an east-west axis. Rather pyramidal form of all of the temples in Angkor. Um, and here's what happens on the spring equinox at Angkor. Stand on that causeway, look at the central tower, stand in the middle, and you'll see that uh, it starts to rise, and then it slowly slides up the tower, nears the top of the tower, and then bingo. The whole place just lights up like a fairy tale kingdom. It's, a, it's, a, it's an amazing experience, and you suddenly realize that this monument, this temple, was built to connect sky and ground at that moment, at that exact moment. It comes alive. That's what it's, that's what it's all about. It's an equinoctial marker, just like the Great Sphinx. There are 72 major temples at Angkor. 
There are curious pyramidal hills in the background at Angkor. There are these amazing structures. Uh, this bridge over to Angkor Thom, 54 figures on each side of the bridge, another processional number. 54 plus 54 equals 108. 108 is 72 plus half of 72, 36. The churning of the Milky Ocean, a relief at Angkor. That's the same thing that's represented in sculpture here. It's represented in a relief here. You see the serpent Vazuki, gods on one side, demons on the other. Actually, these are the demons. These are the gods. Um, they're pulling on Vazuki, the serpent, like he's some huge piece of rope. He's wrapped around Mount Mandera. And it's a churning process. And they're whipping up the Milky Ocean, and they're churning Amrita, the elixir of immortality, the very same gift that is sought by the ancient Egyptians. That's what's produced by this churning of the Milky Ocean. If you trace the major temples of Angkor, you find that they too represent a constellation on the ground. And that is the constellation of Draco in the northern sky. And to cut a long story short, the only time that the correlation works perfectly is in 10,500 BC, exactly the same time that the correlation at Giza works perfectly. I'm not saying the temples of Angkor were built in 10,500 BC. They certainly weren't. They date from about 1100 AD, but archaeologists are finding that there's layers and layers of construction underneath the temples that we see today, as though they're reincarnations of earlier temples. So we have enigmatic ancient sites and religious ideas, widely distributed around the world, extraordinary similarities pointing back to a remote date 12,000 years ago. We've got ancient maps that seem to document the meltdown of the last ice age. Are we looking at the traces of a forgotten episode in human history? I think so. I think that's, that's what's going on here. Um, and because we've forgotten it, because we are a species with amnesia, because we are so much a mystery to ourselves, perhaps it's because of that that we're so lost and so troubled today, so haunted by this sense of something missing, something that we need to know uh, about ourselves. For the ancient Egyptians, the essential mystery of human existence concerned our spiritual essence. Um, that we are participating in this theater of experience that we call life and the world in, in an immense endeavor aimed at the perfection uh, of the soul. That's what we're here to do. Virtually identical ideas uh, were explored at Angkor. Well, in the modern world, sad to say, uh, few such mysteries concern us. This is it. You know, our culture today, we, we have a thing about consciousness, okay? Our, our culture, it admires, it venerates, it almost worships one single state of consciousness, and that is the alert, problem-solving state of consciousness that's useful for science and business and commerce and war and such things. And then we allow ourselves some downtime with absolute drunkenness and stupidity and abandon. That's also accepted by our civilization. But any other kind of state of consciousness is absolutely no-no and not allowed and not encouraged at all. It's as though, it's as though the world is, is, is conspiring to trivialize life, to trivialize us, to bring everything down to the absolute lowest possible level of, of, of uh, hedonism and consumption with nothing else at all being projected as, as worthwhile. I've ta talked with shamans uh, in the Amazon, with whom I've many times drunk the uh, mysterious brew uh, ayahuasca. And when I've asked them, what, what do you think is the problem with the world? What, what's the problem with the West? They say it's, it's very simple. You've severed your connection with spirit. You've cut the link. And you have to restore that link if you're going to move forward from here. You can't, you can't move forward from the place you're in 
if you don't restore the connection to spirit. And that seems to me the most, the most fundamental task uh, that, that all of us now, now face. Um, not these exterior trappings of power that have brought such horror and misery uh, to the world. <sighs> w what's happening in the Amazon is, I mean, it's just, it's just beyond belief. It, 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 beggars, it beggars belief. It's, it, almost makes you, it almost makes you suspect that some kind of demonic force is at work in the world. Um, that, we would, that we would take literally the lungs of the planet and just hack them to pieces that we cut down old growth rainforest, the most, the most extraordinary resource of biodiversity on the planet, 155,000 different species of plants and trees, and replace them with soya bean farms. You know, soya bean farms, which will only be functional for 10 years because rainforest soils are not very fertile. They're, 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 they're made fertile by the constant fall of leaves. Soya bean farms to feed cattle so we can eat hamburgers. What a bad deal we're getting. You know, from, from, from this whole thing. It's very, very crazy. I, I did a back of an envelope calculation. Six months expenditure in Iraq at its height would have solved the problem of the Amazon forever. But we can't make that choice. You know? we, can't, we can't say to the people of the Amazon, we recognize that you have an incredibly pre precious and irreplaceable resource. We would like to take away your economic problems. Please just look after that resource for us. We, can't, we seem incapable of doing that. We can spend that kind of money on wars, but we can't spend it on on, on saving the, mo the most majestic natural resource on the, on the planet. Um, I'm going to close with a reading from the Hermetica, from the Hermetic texts. Hermes was the Greek version of the ancient Egyptian god Thoth. The Romans knew him as uh, Mercury. And uh, in a dialogue, the Hermetica, many of them are dialogues between Thoth, Hermes, and various pupils of his. And in one called the Asclepius, uh, a lament is presented. And it's like a prophecy. It's a bit like the Mayan prophecy. Egypt seems to stand as a metaphor for the whole world in this. And to my mind, for the world in our time, this lament, this prophecy is speaking directly to us. So it's Hermes speaking, and he's saying to Asclepius this, do you know, Asclepius, that Egypt is an image of heaven? Or to speak more exactly, in Egypt, all the operations of the powers which rule and work in heaven are present in the earth below. In fact, it should be said that the whole cosmos dwells in this our land, as in a sanctuary. And yet, since it is fitting that wise men should have knowledge of all events before they come to pass, you must not be left in ignorance of what I will now tell you. There will come a time when it will have been in vain that Egyptians have honored the Godhead with heartfelt piety and service, and all our holy worship will be fruitless and ineffectual. The gods will return from earth to heaven. Egypt will be forsaken and the land which was once the home of religion will be left desolate, bereft of the presence of its deities. O oh, Egypt, Egypt, of thy religion nothing will remain but an empty tale which thine own children in time to come will not believe. Nothing will be left but graven words, and only the stones will tell of thy piety. And in that day men will be weary of life, and they will cease to think the universe worthy of reverent wonder and worship. They will no longer love this world around us, this incomparable work of God, this glorious structure which he has built, this sum of good made up of many diverse forms, this instrument whereby the will of God operates in that which he has made, ungrudgingly favoring man's welfare, this combination and accumulation of all the manifold things that call forth the veneration, praise, and love of the beholder. Darkness will be preferred to light, and death will be thought more profitable than life. No one will raise his eyes to heaven. The pious will be deemed insane, the impious wise, the madman will be thought a brave man, and the wicked will be esteemed as good. 
As for the soul and the belief that it is immortal by nature or may hope to attain to immortality, as I have taught you, all this they will mock and even persuade themselves that it is false. No word of reverence or piety, no utterance worthy of heaven will be heard or believed. And so the gods will depart from mankind, a grievous thing, and only evil angels will remain, who will mingle with men and drive the poor wretches into all manner of reckless crime, into wars and robberies and frauds and all things hostile to the nature of the soul. Then will the earth tremble and the sea bear no ships. Heaven will not support the stars in their orbits. All voices of the gods will be forced into silence. The fruits of the earth will rot. The soil will turn barren and the very air will sicken with sullen stagnation. All things will be disordered and awry. All good will disappear. But when all this has befallen Asclepius, then God, the creator of all things, will look on that which has come to pass and will stop the disorder by the counterforce of his will, which is the good. He will call back to the right path those who have gone astray. He will cleanse the world of evil, washing it away with floods, burning it out with the fiercest fire and expelling it with war and pestilence. And thus he will bring back his world to its former aspect so that the cosmos will once more be deemed worthy of worship and wondering reverence. And God, the maker and maintainer of the mighty fabric, will be adored by the men of that day with continuous songs of praise and blessing. Such is the new birth of the cosmos. It is a making again of all things good, a holy and awe-inspiring restoration of all nature, and it is wrought inside the process of time by the eternal will of the creator. I don't know whether we're going to face some terrible global catastrophe in 2012 or not. I certainly hope not. I hope it will not come down to misery and horror and awful, awful things. There's enough of that in the world already. But I do remember what all the ancient texts say. There isn't a single flood myth. There isn't a single story of the destruction of past civilizations that don't implicate humanity in the story somewhere. Our own behavior, and what we do, is part of what we're bringing down on the world right now. We are, what we are, what we are manifesting in the world, that is what is coming towards us. We are the authors of this thing, and we can change the story if we want to change it. I firmly believe that. This is the moment of crossroads that we stand at. None of us can affect changes on a macro level. It's impossible to do so. Um, but we can make changes on a micro level. We can make changes in our own lives. We can make changes in our immediate surroundings. Changes for the better. Changes driven by love and by, and by hope. Um, I'm a deeply flawed uh, human being. I have tremendous tremendously bad habits and uh, lots of bad aspects to my personality. Over the last decade, decade or so, I've, I've, I've come to look at some of those things objectively, been very much helped by ayahuasca, the, the, the brew that I mentioned from the Amazon in, in doing this. Um, I'm working hard to change my life, to try to, 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 try to be a more nourishing person to people around me. I'm not saying that I'm succeeding. I fail every day, but I'm still trying to do that. And that's really all I can say when we confront something so huge and so, 